here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's an extra, extra special, really, because I've got two for the price of one. Yes, it's going to be the turn of the dentists. And I spoke to Mark Matthews and Bob Collins from the band to find out more about life, love and poetry. And also, which is very exciting bit of news, is that their Janus Long session that was recorded in the late 80s has been... Well, I was going to say reissue, but it's actually released on the Precious Recordings of London, which is going to be available on vinyl, CD, and probably download as well. Just go to the Precious Recordings of London and you too can own a copy. Anyway, this is the interview with Mark and Bob. So after several minutes of interesting but casual chat, we get down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years. And because it's too men at a certain age. Mark is the one that speaks first and then Bob. You'll get the gist from their voice and also I expect Mark's a little bit um, he's turned up or turned on more than Bob. Not literally but um, yes, I think his mic was a little bit higher. Anyway Mark, tell us everything, tell us now. Yeah, my my dad um, was a graphic designer and did a lot of work for RCA back in the sort of late 60s, early 70s. So he did, uh, it was a different process then. He didn't design the actual sleeves, but he did a lot of the um, uh, typographical layout for things like, um, he worked on pinups, Barry Album and um, Aladdin Sane. And he would regularly come home with records from RCA. So I guess my embarrassing musical awakening was was being handed chirpy chirpy cheap cheap by middle of the road i think but that's the first record i can remember him bringing home and me thinking oh this is quite good i wonder how you do this yes um but he did bring home barry singles uh, the big barry single in my house was sorrow do you remember sorrow it was a yeah cover wasn't it um um but he brought home mud and he brought home um uh some other things that weren't quite so good perry como ABBA, uh, yeah, various things. Yeah, it was great. So we used to get lots of free records in the, in the early, late 60s, early 70s. Um, yes. Yeah. That's that very, my musical awakening. That is very the first record, I ever, first record I ever bought with my own money, as Bob probably knows, is, was Can't Stand the Rizillos by the Rizillos, whenever that I, came out, 78, I, Bob. I did, not, I did not know that. No. Oh, did you not? I bought that in Rumbelows in Twiddle, Bob. Oh, <laughs> fine, fine shop. So Rumblows yeah. in Twiddle, I used to go down there and I used to see there was two albums that I always used to look at but never bought. One was Live at the Roxy, that punk compilation. And the other one was the, the kind of Sire New Wave um, compilation with the red cover and the punk gobbing on the front. And I used to look at those time and time again and think, I'm not quite sure I want to buy them because I haven't mm. got enough money. But mm. they're both <laughs> probably quite fine albums. I don't anyway. know. Live, live at the Roxy. I don't. You know, it's a bit. You don't need it, really. I don't. Think okay, I'm, I'm glad to be vindicated in that. I, <laughs> I didn't buy it. I wasn't missing out. Thank you. No, it was. It was a bit <laughs> of time. So, what was your kind of moment, Bob, that happened? <clears throat> well, um, really, it was um, 1972, and it was just seeing and becoming aware of Top of the Pops for the first time. And it was the Osmonds, and it was Slade, and it was Sweet. So kind of, you know, similar stuff to Mark, really. Um, uh, and that, and that was my my kind of uh, awakening, really. And then, but also, so so that was my kind of contemporary awakening. And so I was well into the, all the glam stuff and all that. Um, but I was then I also saw Christmas 1973. I saw a Hard Day's Night, and I was obsessed by the Beatles um from that point on so uh i had uh i had that kind of going on in in the sidebar as well yes did did did, did things like the monkeys or um i don't know those other tv programs did they come into your consciousness like the banana splits banana splits yeah. not so much i remember i vaguely remember the osmond's cartoon um the monkeys, kind of, but I, I was probably a bit late, a bit of a teenager before I realised 
actually they were that was pretty good um <laughs> Yes, we, 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 we sort of embarrassingly kind of liked them. It was a guilty pleasure for, for decades. Well, it? But, it, it, but now we know that it not to be guilty about it because the Monkeys were a fine band, as, as anyone with any sense now knows and realises, I think. Yes. So when did you get a kind of um, a musical instrument, Mark? Um, God, that would be a good question. Um... I got. I did get a guitar somewhere around. It must be nineteen seventy seven, seventy eight. I guess I'd be about twelve or thirteen when I actually got a guitar. But I didn't do a great deal with it. Um, and it kind of just it was a it was a cheap guitar, but it sounded like a good idea. And then it seemed very difficult to play. So then I decided that bass was the way forward. Um, and I swapped my racing bike for a bass guitar with somebody um, and then played bass and then tried to form a band with Bob where we both played bass. Right. So that's another on. story entirely. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess, I guess I did have a guitar, first of all. And as I say, it wasn't a very, you know, it wasn't an expensive guitar or anything. It was one of those cheap things you can get off catalogs. Do you remember catalogs? You used to be able oh to buy God. anything off a catalog, yeah. Great great universal so off... catalog and and yeah. And all those were, it was like Little a, Woods, I think it was, was. A, a sort of a glossy book of wishes, really, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah you... Bill Bailey does a very good sketch about that sort of thing where he refers to the Argos catalogue as being uh, the you know, laminated book of joy or something. Yes, that's what right, where it catches your, your, your tears of joy. That's it, that's it yeah. With a little yeah, stuff. A yes. laminated book of dreams to catch your tears of joy or something. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's Bill Bailey. Uh, yes. And what about so, you? yeah, it would have been about them. Yes. And Bob, what was your moment that you thought, I'm going to invest in a guitar? Well, a uh, little bit older than Mark. So I've got to say, Mark, until this moment, I didn't realise you had a guitar before you yeah. had a bass. Yeah. That's, we learn something every day. <laughs> I, I, so when we were about, me and Mark went to the same school, when we were about 14 or 15, there was a little, um, I didn't know, until that point, I didn't know anyone who had a musical instrument that I was interested in at all. Um, and then probably at 14, 15, a few boys, we went to an all boys school, um, started kind of getting guitars. Some boys had older brothers. I had a friend called Bill Bishop, and he had an older brother who had an electric guitar. And I went around Bill's house one day, and uh, Bill could play a little bit, and he could just about play Day Tripper, and he could play Jimmy Jazz by The Clash, and a couple of other things. And I picked it up, and I just thought, oh, yeah. And like Mark, I'd always looked in the catalogues and where they had electric guitars, like there was a, a brand called K electric guitars. Yeah. And even though they're like the shittiest guitars probably imaginable, they were in the catalogue and I just I thought, wow. And just to have, just to touch an electric guitar was such a thrill because it was just unattainable at those day, in those days. Um, so anyway, that got the bug, and then I thought, right, so my, for my 15th birthday, um, I persuaded my mum and dad to buy me a bass guitar and an amp. And it was 25 quid each, so that was a huge amount of money for my parents back then, but they bought it for me. Um, and so that was it. And so I had a bass, and Mark had a bass, and lots of other boys at school wanted to say lots, maybe about, eight or ten other people that we knew had guitars um and mark said to me why don't we form a band with two bass players me and you mm. and i went hmm, okay and i'm thinking to myself that's not a shit idea but, <laughs> but okay let's let's i'm 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 game let's let's, let's try something so we, we so I, I quite i quite soon uh Borrowed some, borrowed someone's guitar and switched to guitar. Uh, yes. Neil Reardon was the person whose guitar I borrowed, a great friend of mine. Uh, and uh, yeah, so then we kind of rectified ourselves and we established, and we got a keyboard player called Stephen Brady, who was Mark's friend, went to a different school. And uh, we got a drummer because no one at our school played drums. We didn't know anyone who played drums I at our school, but Mark had. Older friend from, from primary school called Ian Smith, who played drums, and 
had actually done gigs in a band. So uh, we got together and that was the first incarnation of the band that became the dentists eventually. Oh. God damn, you were quite quite ambitious. So when you got to 1980, were you all hitting 16 at that stage and possibly leaving school, or were you hitting 16 and staying for A-levels? No, oh, 15. So I was born in, me and Bob were born in 65, so we were 15 going on 85. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, we were, we, were, we were just in that age where we were just slightly too young for punk, Yes. Uh, so, yeah. our, our, I mean, again, I, I'm not speaking for Bob necessarily, but we we kind of grew up with the Teardrop Explodes, Echo and the Bunny Men, Joy Division. They were kind of, I don't know, Bob, if you agree, they were, they were more our sort of yeah. heroes yeah. at the time, as well yeah. as obviously listening to a lot of 60s. It's a funny thing, because when, when you're being the generation we were, it's like one or two years really mattered. It mm. would have been... Two years, one year older, we'd have just been into punk and nothing else. If we were one year younger, we might have just been into new romantics. But there was like an in between period of like post punk, pre 80s, that was just, and when I looked back, I think at the time I thought, oh, I wish I'd been born in, you know, a time when I was 15 in the 60s. But actually, when I look back, the time we were born was just a really lucky time. It was 15, just yeah. being in that cusp of 79, 80, 81. It was, it's just one of the most interesting periods of music, and we just kind of landed there, and that was our formative years. And, and there was so much weirdness and, and lots of different things going on that um, really informed what we kind of grew yes. into. Did you also have that thing that um, I experienced was sometimes... You'd hit, you'd see something, you know, you'd say the name of a band or an album, everyone talking about it, but you couldn't get to listen to it because there was no kind of access without buying mm. something. So mm. things would like, oh yes, have you heard this? And it's like, no, but I know it's, know it's there. Yeah. Did you have that kind of experience as well? Because nowadays you yeah. can just go, oh, let me have a quick listen. Oh no, I don't like it. Fair enough. But mm. then it's like, oh, what am I missing? Never mind, it's gone. So um, yeah. yes, what, what was it like? Do you have more access? I, I came from the middle of the countryside in East Anglia. It felt very barren culturally. Yeah, I mean, as as, as we all know, John Peel was the, was the beacon of light at this time. So you, you listened to John Peel as much as you could. I mean, literally, you know, even on the school night, I would literally do the cliche of, you know, being curled up under the under the blankets with my tiny radio listening to John Peel. I, I definitely did that without a shadow of a doubt. But also at the time, I remember you, you being able to walk into record shops. I mean, there was a couple of good ones in Gillingham, a couple of good ones in Chatham in the Medway Towns. And you could ask, to, can I listen to this? I've, I've read about this or I've heard about this on John Pill. Can I listen to this? And most of the record shops would have headphones with turntables and you could you could stand there for as long as you could get away with it and listen to, to an album. So I certainly did that. I, I know... Bob, I don't know if you knew the guy. Do you remember? Was it called Stars? I think in Gillingham High Street or Stars something. But we befriended the guy in there, and he was always quite pleased to see us because we occasionally would buy something. So he was always happy to let us, you know, put the headphones on and stand in the corner with the turntable and listen to stuff. But you're right. How how people <laughs> cope without the internet today? I've no idea. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah what was your, what was mystery. what was the first gig you went to then? Yeah. So m mine was super cool, I think. I saw the monochrome set at the YMCA in Tottenham Court Road. That was the first gig I went, I went to. So, um, yeah. Nice. Were you there? Did you come with me, Bob? I can't remember. No, no. I, I, I remember at school people being just about 15 and going to gigs, and I, I was a bit late off the blocks. Um, I was a bit jealous, but also a bit scared. Uh, the first gig I went to, was um, on the 12th of December, 1981, I went to see the jam at the Michael Sobel Sports Centre, which is a big sports centre near in Finsbury Park. Um, yeah, so that that was the first gig I went to. Um, Had they just released Beat Surrender at that stage? No, it was just before that. They were just playing tracks that would appear on Gift, so they were debuting happy together and ghosts and things like that precious um and so the first band i ever saw because they were the first band on that bill 
Uh, I think playing maybe their first gig was Banana Rama. <laughs> Didn't know uh, that. There you go. It was Banana Rama, oh, Questions, well. Department S, and the Jam. Yeah. My God, all for four pounds and fifty p. Probably, yeah. 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 <laughs> and and uh, that was at, in Finsbury Park, and at the Rainbow next door, the Exploited were playing. So you can imagine the punk mod clash there. Yes, that would be very intimidating. Did you get, you know, like 1980 was kind of a politically kind of hot potato, really, wasn't it? We had 79, Thatcher got in, then we had the Falkland War, you know, the miners' strike, Greenham Common, everything kind of kicking off. Did you, did that sort of start to have any impact on your sensitive young souls? Mm, not particularly. I did go to a couple of... Uh rock against racism typey things there was one in alexandra palace again i don't know if you went bob where bands like um red crayola and essential logic and um bands like that played i remember sort of sk skulking around the background of yeah. those sort of things but we didn't know why we were there we just knew there were <laughs> kind of bands and it was really cheap <laughs> I, i'd say for me it was like music i, I kind of I, I kind of respect people who you know can write about politics and or, or the you know situations and but it's kind of it didn't really enter our music because we were just like you know i might have thought about those things and had feelings about them but like the music was just something that was just music it wasn't we didn't you know for me the music wasn't a vehicle to have something to say about any social comment i'm not even sure i could uh you know, some people are good at writing songs that kind of reflect those things. That that wasn't really what drove us musically. I think it's fair to say. No, so but we had, yeah. we, well, I suppose we had people like Attila, the stockbroker, and then we had the Redskins and Billy Braggart during that period. And you know, then Red Wedge came along, which was probably more your period, wasn't it? I just wondered if you were thinking, God, we better, we better get socialists. We better get the Socialist Workers <laughs> Party paper and not read it, but we'd light the fire with it. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. It never happened to us, I don't think. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was just a kind of weird thing for, for us. The, the, the music and that kind of thing, you know, we might have had personal feelings about that kind of thing, which, you know, I was certainly of that, you know, alliance of that kind of thinking. But it wasn't, it didn't really, you know, I guess with some bands, the music naturally kind of links in with that. With us, the music was just like something different. Yes. Yeah. So did you we stay never... on? At, did you stay on at six form and then leave at eighteen? Yeah. Yeah. In and fact, then did, I, did you did you both go to university or did you think no we're gonna no. we're gonna make it on the road we're gonna do it? One of well, the reasons. I, I, yeah, don't come up. I was gonna say <laughs> I, I did a year a year at art college before before deciding yeah we were gonna make it on the road uh, and obviously we didn't. But yeah, so was that the foundation course? <clears throat> yeah, exactly that. Yeah, yeah, exactly that, David. I did a foundation course. I was a year after, I think, a year or maybe two years after Tracy Emin and and Billy Childish. My God, uh, there you go. The Medway you... College of Design. Yeah, that's my claim to fame. Is Tracy Emin used to get me to try and buy her drinks in the Nags Head in Rochester. So that's my claim to fame. Now you'll have to go open water swimming with her instead. <laughs> yeah. which, might, which could be a bit more hard. <laughs> Very though. dangerous these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, so one of happened? the reasons. Yeah, sorry, sorry, but... I was sorry. Before I answer, really. No, um, I, so I, one of the reasons the dentist exists is because uh, on the eve of my first A level, I got chicken pox and I had to do half the papers at home a teacher had to come and sit in my house and do the exam and I, I failed them and had i passed them i would have probably gone away somewhere and the dentist might not have existed or i might have done but, it, but because i didn't pass i stayed for the year retake my a levels during which time the dentist actually formed and became quite popular in Medway and then I thought actually this, this is better than anything I vague notion I had of going to university so I kind of I stayed around um and yeah so it's just one of those kind of quirks quirks of fate really 
My God, that is a quirk of fate, actually. Yeah. So did, at that at that stage, because a lot of the bands, obviously, in the 80s, you know, were unemployed or on the job seekers, land, enterprise land schemes and all those. Did did you sort of have, to, did you do that side or did you get jobs and then do the band as a sort of a bit of a side hustle? So I, I did. Um, so I, I started a record label and an enterprise land scheme. Um uh, and then as a result of starting the record label, I then was given the offer, offered a job at Pinnacle Distribution, who were the distributors for Factory and a few other big labels, 4AD and a big other few, la- few labels in the early sort of 80s. So I did exa- exactly that, go down the Enterprise Allowance Scheme. Um, I also got a grant that was called the Kemp Foundation. And um, I, I, yeah, I was the only thing I know about that is I was one of the only people to ever actually pay the grant back. You know, actually, they, they said normally they give the grants out and they don't expect to see the money again. But I actually did make a little bit of a profit and paid them back. So they were quite impressed with that. But, yeah, I don't think you didn't do Enterprise Allowance. Did you, Bob, or anything like no, that? No, 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 you did it for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I I, I, uh, no, well, I finished A-levels um, uh, and then retook them, you know, did a year retake and then the dentist has started and then I got offered a, my friend, uh, Jeff Cook said, phoned me up and said, oh, there's a couple of weeks temporary work going at my place and it happened to be, um, um, an office of the, uh, Department of Health and Social Security. So I accidentally became a civil servant and I still am. Excellent. This so, is good. You know, yeah. You've got all your pension contributions anyway, so that's important. Yeah, now it's looking <laughs> like a good move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for years it wasn't. Yes. Yeah. Did you so when when the band formed, did the did you get the sound quite quite together, you know, together quite quickly? Because because around the time you were forming, yeah, you know, this was for me, 83, the Smiths are there, and, and suddenly there's this mm-hmm. fantastic chapter for five years. Indie pop has never sounded so good. So did you get kind of excited by that indie movement that happened during the 80s? Uh, yeah, again, uh, yeah, very much so. Um, again, it was the John Peel thing under the under the bed covers, you know, listening to John Peel religiously. But to hear the Smiths, I mean, I remember the first time I heard Hand in Glove and I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is the best thing I've ever heard in my life. We, we need to get, we, you know, this, this we've been, you know, tampering with this whole music thing we need to take it seriously because this kind of stuff is like fantastic this is what we want to be doing so uh, I, I imagine bob had a similar epiphany but certainly mm. the smiths were there for me and orange juice and all those great bands having having i mean i think <clears throat> one of the things that the teardrops and echo and the bunny men in particular not joy division so much but certainly bunny men you would we we sort of absorbed echo and the bunny men and what they were doing and then we looked for what what it, the references that Echo and the Bunny Women were making. So that sort of led me personally, I don't know about the others, but me back towards the 60s. So towards the Doors and, you know, the Doors in particular, but all those kind of 60s bands that were coming in that, that the Bunny Men were using. We thought that that was, I personally thought that was the reference material that you used for them to do something new in the early 80s. And then the Smiths just kind of came along and kind of, yeah, just put the icing on, on that sort of cake that was kind of baking, if you like. I yes. don't know. Bob, if that's a, a, the way you saw it? Similar, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, as we said before, we kind of, maybe our formative years were in those kind of post-punk areas where, you know, uh, the sort of eight, 79 to 81, where there was loads of great things going on, that kind of wake of our imagination, I guess. Um, personally, I got a bit disillusioned with music around about 82 uh, onwards. Contemporary music just seemed to be going in directions that I didn't really like. The Smiths were a bit of a bright, a, a, a bit of a beacon. I also, hand in glove, really, I thought, wow, yeah, that was a big moment. Um, we'd kind of already started going uh, by then. Um, but I personally was went on a bit of a voyage of rediscovery of, of the 60s. I mean, I'd, I'd always been a Beatles fan, but getting really into the kinks and the birds and some 60s garage stuff. So which was kind of, you know, a lot of people thought was very kind of retro or re- revivalist at the time. But to me, it was just like I'm discovering something that's brand new to me. And it was 
you know, a whole lot more exciting than a lot of the stuff that's going on at the time. Yeah. Um, I didn't really, I didn't, and now, I mean, in hindsight, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on in 83, 84, 85, but at the time I was kind of more or less oblivious to it because I just kind of shut myself off from it. Um, stopped listening to John Peel, stopped reading The Enemy, um, and it wasn't until the kind of maybe when we been going a couple of years eight, and we started hearing about other bands that were maybe more like kindred spirits uh in the kind of mid to late 80s that i kind of started getting becoming more aware of uh all the other kind of contemporary stuff that was going on yes like people did... like you know maybe you know the wedding present or whoever else did you did you sort of in because there was a club in london called is it alice in wonderland who had this kind of slightly retro vibe to them who sort of yeah I suppose Paisley there was did you did you sort of get into that kind of scene at all because your some of your sound is quite has a sort of quite a 60s reference doesn't it I vaguely remember the Alice in Wonderland club being somewhere that was talked about and wouldn't it be great to go there but I never went there but I think we were both we were aware that there was a bit of a kind of psychedelic I think there was the kind of mini psychedelic revival in about 1981, and then it, it became a bit more prominent in about 84. So obviously we're from Medway, we knew we were friends with uh, the Prisoners and Alan Crocker had produced our first album, so they were more into the kind of psychedelic world maybe than we were, but we were definitely influenced by that kind of thing. Um, I wouldn't, it was quite, I wouldn't say we had kind of a lot of kindred spirits in in the kind of bands that were around at the time. I mean. We later got tagged for this, you know, psych, you know, UK psych, but we never felt we were part of anything. We didn't really have a connection with a lot of, you know, other bands at that at that time, uh, particularly. We did get, we did get, I mean, in terms of, we never got much music press uh, coverage, but we did get, where we did get a lot of, you know, praise and coverage was in um, uh, kind of magazine, stroke, fanzine, stroke magazine called Bucket Full of Brains, which was run right. by John John Story, who became a friend of ours. So he was kind of, I think we kind of got kind of ingratiated into a lot of. He wrote a lot about a lot of those kind of bands, um, the kind of neo psychedelic bands, Paisley Underground bands. So we were kind of covered in the same kind of um, articles as, as they were uh, to some extent. Yes. And when you came, your first single, which was a bit of a classic, wasn't it? Can you remember much about how that came about? What was the process? Well, um, <clears throat> yeah. You remember the process, Mark? <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Well, I, I, I do remember it vividly. Uh, so um, me, Mark and Ian Smith um, had been, you know, had this band for about a year and a half and cut a long story short we we, we needed a, a singer um and Mick Murphy came along and that kind of made that that changed everything that kind of made the band a complete if you like and we had all of our songs that we'd already written but Mick came up Mick was a songwriter and not the very first but one of the first things he did was came up with this song and it was just literally him simple strumming acoustic guitar and I remember going he, he we used to rehearse in his parents garage uh we were literally a garage band um and he played this song strawberries are growing in my garden and he had the whole unusually for me normally he would have fragments of songs and we would kind of assemble them but he had this one all the lyrics were written um and it just came together really quickly I just did this jangly guitar over the top um and it was kind of, it was just done, you know, and I think we knew straight away that it was a bit of a special one. And when we did our first gigs, it was the, I, I remember once, maybe over me, the second or third time we played it, it was like, uh, and we said, yeah, this one's called Strawberries, the grind, and, you know, a few people in the crowd, wait, oh, they know it already. <laughs> so we, when we came to record a single, we thought, but it's got to be that one. You know, it's got to be that one, hasn't it? It's kind of obvious. Yes. And when did John Peel pick up on it? I'm not sure 
Peel was never a massive fan. He used to play us, and when we had a record out, he'd make he would play it once or twice, but he never really. He was never like a major. We didn't get any. He wasn't a major fan. I don't think he would kind of give us airtime, but but not a not a huge amount. Yes. And what was the label that you were on at this stage? Was this your own label? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that was that was our own label. So um, that was just a the, the, a name that well, I had nothing to do with the name. It was more Ian and, and Bob <laughs> coming up with a, a record label name. So it was called Spruck, which was a word that they made up. Um, but the 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 bit of luck that we had, and I, I'm never totally sure of the whole story, but. We, we, our, our target at the time was just to make a single and sell it to our friends. Really, that was the, that was the main thing. But somebody handed a copy of Strawberries to um, Bax Distribution in Norwich, um, and uh, my version of the story, and this is open to debate, is that it was a it was a young lady that was very interested in Michael, and to try and impress him, she sent out copies of Strawberries to several different distributors to try and get us a distribution deal. Which is how how you used to do things in the uh, in the early eighties, and back, backs of Norwich, um, Bob will probably tell this story better than I do. But they that they told us when when they actually got back in touch with us and said, yeah, we're, we're very keen, we want to do something. They said that they they got strawberries and they they played it quite late in the afternoon, so sort of about four or five just before they were going home, and they thought, yeah, you know, it's okay. And then the three of them coming back into the office the following morning were all whistling it as they came back into the office. And when they got back into the office the following morning, they said, hang on a minute, that song that we played yesterday afternoon, we need that, we've got to have that. Uh, and so that, that's how we ended up with a distribution deal with Bax. But it was purely, my recollection is it was a, a young lady trying to impress Mick at the time. But I don't know if that's your recollection, Bob. You can embellish that story as you see fit. No, I think that is true. That is my recollection too. I think we, I don't think we ever met, actually met her, um, but it was just one of those random acts. That, um, yeah, it didn't even occur to us to send the no, records off to no, distributors, did no. it? We, we hadn't even got that far in our thinking. So we she, she pressed our copies. Yeah. But weirdly, she did, the, same, she did. The, same, the same girl, um, we were talking about Sweet earlier, the, the oh, yeah. same person. <laughs> I love kept telling us that we were going to support the suite and she'd arranged this gig with us to support the suite and it just developed into one of these stories that ended up having no truth to it at all <laughs> it was a very bizarre episode so but we have to hand it to her whoever you are whoever you, i can't even remember what was her name jane um we jane never met or janice her, or janine she changed, or something she changed our life she changed your life so once that single came out and you got the airplane was there all sort of all hands to the deck to get the album written and recorded? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I think the backs were very excited and said, you know, what what you you know what what else have you got up your sleeve kind of thing? Have you got more songs? Do they sound as good as strawberries? Blah 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 blah. Um, yeah, and I think we funded the album ourselves at the time, didn't we? I, can't, I think backs didn't put money in until oranges. Did no, they, I think I, I think we we. we... We borrowed various, we did a bit of a crowd, it wasn't called that at the time, but I think we did a bit of a crowdfunding thing. We got various yeah. people to put in 100 quid each and we swore blind they would get their money back. I'm not sure if we believed <laughs> it or not, but I think they all did. And your dad your dad put a load of money into that, didn't he, Mark? Yeah, he my dad won, won, a, won a bet on the Grand National. Yeah, oh, he won, he won yeah, a bet on the Grand National. That's a great story oh. because... Um, yeah. We, yeah, because is. he basically put his winnings into the album and then on the album, because Mark's dad did the printing for the album, he did all the typesetting like he did with Aladdin Sane and, and others. And so Mark, we wanted to thank him on the album sleeve, give him a, a credit. Um, but we knew that if we put his name on there, he would take it off because he would, he would be modest about it. So Mark came up with this anagram. So it's... Uh, of Stan Wistermide. Um, so his Mark's dad's name was Sidney Matthews, Sidney with a Y. So he came up with this anagram, Stan Wistermide. So his dad printed the album, it came out, and only then did Mark tell his dad, That's you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is such a nice little bit. And there's a couple of really standout songs. I had an excellent dream. Where did this one come from? 
Go on, Bob. I'm, uh, I've no idea. Well, you, you wrote it. <laughs> well, I, I wrote right. the words. I, I came up words. with a riff. I came up with a little riff uh, and, and the chord structure. It was actually one of these weird combinations that we never actually, um, we were quite collaborative in some way. I come up with the riff and the chords. Mick come up with the vocal melody, which I wouldn't have come up with. And then Mark come up with the lyrics, which fitted Mick's vocal melody, but Mick would have never thought of. So it was, it was a, 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 a major kind of collaborative effort. Yes, there you go. So with indie bands, I mean, we hear a lot about the 70s and you know, bands like Hawkwind. What was the general, you know, recreation or drug and drink of choice for an indie <laughs> band in Midway? You know, was, what, was, what was the go-to thing for a sort of indie band at this stage? God, we, we certainly didn't have any money for recreational drugs, that's for sure. But, no, find the courage uh, best down the next edge. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and Newcastle Brown, I think, we were mainly fuelled by yeah. that sort of time. Whiskey and Newcastle Coke, Brown now. Yeah, yeah, whiskey whis and Coke was the other thing. Yeah. Which I was that's only true. drinking because somebody told me that's what the Beatles used to drink. Yeah, they, and well, Coke me was too. Like. Yeah, of course. That's, you know. Yeah, well, that's I'm the only reason I was drinking it. I, did, I just <laughs> wondered if you started thinking we've got to be a bit more psychedelic, we need to take, you know, some psychedelic drugs. No, I wouldn't, no, no, we, I wouldn't have said so. <laughs> we're, we're, we're a bit scared to take uh, proper drugs. I'm not, yeah. not sure we haven't got over the health anyway, but no. Uh, and what about so other tracks on the album? Tony Tony Bastable versus John <laughs> Noakes. How did that one come about? Well, we 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 liked to have, as you may know, if you if you study our, our songs and our titles, we quite liked to, the idea of having song titles that bore no relation to the lyrics. I think probably about half of them on that album. Um, no, that that that's just. Uh, yeah, I don't know what was going through our minds, but we just, we had vivid imaginations. Yeah, so, we did. Yeah. And Everything in the Garden, your penultimate track on the album. Yeah. How did this one come yeah. out? Well, most of the songs cool. brought together by various members and you just jammed them together. I just, was it a bit like when you watched the Beatles eight hour documentary? You know, <laughs> the, was it a little bit like that? You could relate to that that kind of vibe of people bringing I, bits I, to I think everyone who's ever been in a band can relate to to get back. It's just it's heartwarming to see that it's like even though they're the Beatles, they just doing exactly the same things that every other band does, having little misunderstandings and guitars falling over and stuff. Um we the the process was, I mean it was it was always very collaborative. We didn't we weren't precious about songwriting. Mick probably came up originated most of the songs, his at least tunes, but he wasn't he didn't write complete tunes. So he would have the bare bones, and then we'd all kind of pile in. Yeah, and someone would I do some guitar riffs. One of us would write the lyrics. Mick was Mick's um, songwriting process was very much all about melody and syllables or words would just come out of his head to propel the melody they wouldn't make any <laughs> sense so we'd kind of try and make some sense out of them or maybe just not make any sense but try and make some interesting words out of them um which when we played live mick would just ignore and just sing what he, he always had done um and i think we were driven by just i, I just again going back to that kind of post-punk era I think we were driven by a desire to just not be boring and to make things a bit more off beam and a bit interesting and a bit surreal. Um, so, yeah, we, we just had kind of had that kind of bit of a drive about us to just kind of not be, not be just another band, but just be kind of dull and boring. Uh -huh. I was thinking yeah. the other day because the way the way Mick used to approach it was as Bob says he he would just sing any old rubbish, and then he would leave it to one of us to to write the lyrics. So invariably the li the lyrics were written by either me or or Bob or Ian. Even Ian contributed lyrics as well at the time. Mick very rarely would come with lyrics, but what Mick was doing is basically <laughs> pavement made a whole career out of just singing complete rubbish over you know great great tunes and and we should have just gone with whatever Mick was uh, coming out with. Although a lot of the time it would have been 
death and glory and war, as Bob always likes to quote, but that, that's mainly yeah. with mixed words. But he, he, he just used to vocalise and then we would fit stuff around him, which was an interesting way of doing it. And it, it, it became, for me, it became a bit problematic that, that ultimately when I started to take writing lyrics much more seriously, it was very difficult that for the, if the singer didn't address the, didn't, you know, convey the lyrics in the way that sort of I wanted to as the lyricist. And, uh, and Mick answered a lot of questions about, what does this song mean? What's this song about? Which was always a bit irritating for me as well. But yeah, it's a bit of a strange way to go about things, Bob. Yes, it was. <laughs> like to see what you did there. <laughs> did you did you have that period of being in the transit band going around the UK? Oh sort yeah. Of, did you sort of did you play most of the indie club nights up and down the country? C- certainly in the south, um, not so much in the north. Legendarily, we never ever played in in Scotland, um, to much, much to my regret. But um, we certainly had a lot of trips in vans going all over the country, yeah. so without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, and so trips around to Europe to as well. Yeah, we toured in Europe. We uh, we we never actually toured the UK. We did a few handful of gigs, but no, we never we never got on the kind of the UK touring circuit as it was. We 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 would do a handful of gigs. Typically, people who Friends of ours had gone to university in Leeds or Manchester or wherever, or um, we'd, we'd kind of do gigs, Bristol we played in. Um, but the actual proper touring we did in Europe, um, uh, Belgium and Germany and, and wherever else, and, yes. and eventually the States. So who was your booking agent for the European dates? Yeah, got an agency called The Foundation, which exists today. So uh, a guy called Peter Verstralen. Um, he again, I think, was accidentally handed a tape of us by somebody else, uh, and thought this was quite good, and decided he would, you know, risk a couple of gigs in Belgium, see what happened. Um, and they went really well, so we risked a couple of gigs in Belgium, and maybe one in Holland and one in Germany, and gradually it spiraled from there to to the point where we were doing quite, you know, fairly biggish kind of tours nice. um, around all those sorts of countries. So yeah, he, he was a great guy, Peter. He he would he would you know do everything um running his own agency and he books a lot of indie bands at that time he, he left some stories to tell peter oh, when he told yeah. us a few stories yeah um, yeah so he, he was i think to give her credit i think it was leave who gave me leave him on and oh yeah it could have been yeah yeah the, the tape and, and we we got a gig in a random gig the first time we ever played in uh mainland europe we got a random gig in, in france these these kids who run this club booked us to play and i think on the back of that um we got these we got these gigs in belgium um uh on the strength of it but peter was he was a great friend uh became a great friend and he got us our first gigs and that was at the very start of his booking agency and he, he's now he moved on to you know much bigger and better things it's quite a big outfit now um, that must have been really amazing during that period going around Europe because yeah. I think in those days you could get a passport just going to a post office with a tenner and sort of getting a one year passport, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 It was, it and, was... and also we were yeah, we, we were pre um uh the lack of I don't know what you'd call it, but the lack of borders. Schengen, is it? I don't I can't remember. Single but market. we were master yeah, single market. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, the master tree. So we were having to cross every border and fill out something called a carnet where you have to list all your equipment. And we were going through various border checks. So we've got lots of stories about trying to get in and out of France and all this yeah. kind of thing. Um, we also played in Berlin before the wall came down, didn't we, Bob? Um, and then yeah, we played just... in Berlin after the wall came down. So where which did is very you play entertaining. in Berlin? What was the venue? Was something like X Club or Ecstasy Club or something? It was called, e- it, it was called XTC, but it was pronounced oh, yeah. Ecstasy. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, so that was weird. So that was one year. So um, just to <laughs> get a little bit anal here. So Bob's on the story. In so we had um, because two of our drummer then Alan and the roadie Rob, who later became our drummer, only had one year visitors passports. So they had so they were they couldn't go along the land corridor to East Germany on those passports. Oh, yes. So we had to drop them at the airport at Hanover. And then we and they got a plane at great expense. <laughs> and we had, we went yeah. across and we had to meet them in Berlin. Um just just to give you an idea of how this kind of weird, complicated uh, route that it was. 
Yes. Um, but it was fascinating. That that really just you know going going to just that experience of going to Europe, it kind of rekindled my interest in just languages. And I, I, I'm to this day, I'm obsessed with the, like Berlin and, and the Berlin Wall and Germany and, and that kind of Cold War thing. It was, it was just so, so weird. Um, and and yeah, yeah, later, as Mark says, then we went back um, again after the wall came down. Uh, Did you ever go, so. David? Have you? You have been yes, to Berlin well, before I, the wall I've, came I've down? been a few times. Once when the wall was up, and then just after mm. it had come down. So I've got a, a plastic bag with you know chippings of the wall in in the loft. Oh yeah, and then then again a few I don't know a year or, or I don't know how many years, a decade after the wall had come down. And it's one of those countries I have very fond memories. I always remember going with my friend Andrew Self. His brother had um, John Self had gone there as a kind of a student who'd been kicked out of university and there was a lot of English guys who went to Berlin and you could get a job really easily on one of those Air Force bases and John was one of the few people who decided to learn German and stay there and we went and and hung out there that was in 1987 when they were celebrating the 750th anniversary of Berlin so I was quite yeah. I remember so we were like walking around and, and I always remember John saying oh don't worry you won't get beaten up and I remember thinking Really? But, you know, most <laughs> cities you go to, you get a bit kind of jumpy, don't you? Whereas we yeah. walk around going, no, actually, you won't get beaten up in Berlin, will you? It just it, it had such an easy vibe to it. You know, it was kind of weird. I, I always remember that and just hanging out and going, oh, where did David Bowie used to hang out? Let's go and hang out there and, and being yeah, very yeah. disappointed at some really rubbish bar. But being amazed because you could sit there and they would just keep giving you drinks without paying mm. until the end, didn't you? And they went, oh, shit, that's loads of money. <laughs> So, um, There's a great podcast actually called it's called Cold War Conversations and it's just about that whole thing and, and they this guy just an amateur thing but he talks to you know people who've just got genuine experience of people who are either in the British forces or East Germans or people who just went visiting and got arrested yes. or whatever it's very fascinating yeah we also we also went uh, on our last major European tour to what was then only just about Yugoslavia, uh, about mm. three months before it fragmented. And that yeah. was really, really fascinating uh, and interesting because um, we went to uh, what is now, well, it was then, but it wasn't an independent country. We went to Slovenia, Croatia, um, uh, yeah, that, uh, which, was, which, was, which was really eye-opening. Did you take a yeah. trip over by going back to Berlin? Did you go to East Berlin during that, you know, and have an not, afternoon? Not when the wall was up. No. Yeah. Um, I, we, yeah. uh, one of my overriding memories of going to Berlin the first for the first time was those, they had those plat viewing platforms, didn't they, where you could climb yeah. up and look over the wall. Yes. And it was like just that, that you know, otherworldly, really, just look over the wall and look at East Berlin. Yeah. But we, but as Bob said, we did, when the wall came down, and we toured um, with the record company. We we did go back and play schools and things in East, oh, East Berlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you remember doing that? Those those yeah, schools so, we played during the day. Yeah. So so when when we were, I mean, so we skipped forward a few years now. So ninety four when we signed <laughs> to East West and made our major label. So East West America picked us up. East West in the UK had no interest in us whatsoever. East no. West Germany picks up on us, bizarrely. Great, good for them. Um, but they thought what would be a great idea was to get us, us and three other bands on the label to go to Germany and not just do four gigs together, but play schools and just every day for three, four days, go to three schools. And, play. and it was the most, that was quite a bizarre experience because yeah. it's like, I don't know, don't let record companies organise live performances. They don't know what they're doing. It was, it was quite, it was quite strange. Um, uh, turning up at these various schools and colleges, and then not quite knowing what was going on. Anyway, it was. Um, I, I won't bore you with all the details, but yeah, it, it, it was just lit literally oh, acoustic no. sets in the classroom, wasn't it? We just turn yeah. up in somebody's classroom. With guitars I mean, like, and then just yeah, start playing yeah. songs like we like play four songs one, or something like the first one was just like a tiny little classroom full of like four and five year olds who obviously were like completely yeah, yeah. dumbfounded it's like what <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're not interested in us and then 
we go up the road to this route into the like depths of East Berlin to this huge hall of like 15 year old skinheads, neo Nazis, or whatever they were, and just like <laughs> this is a bit different. And then we go, to, and then the next one would be at some secretarial college. <laughs> it's truly bizarre. Yeah. Um, God, that is. Because I remember actually, I'd forgotten this at school. You'd have some strange theatre company that would come and do some bit of mm. like legs akimbo doing some sort of performance. And, and it was yeah. all a little bit, I don't know what they did, but I do remember this like this vague memory of a couple of people who'd obviously been at drama school or were still at drama school touring schools doing something yeah. that was probably uh, to do with contraception or something. I don't yeah. know, I can't remember, but it was probably a bit odd. But being 14 and all being a bit like, oh my God, this yeah. is a bit weird, you know. And, and I think, yeah, I think the idea was like, these are your fans of the future. They'll always remember this. And, and like, I, I often wonder, of all those like 12 schools that played it, is there a single like kid <laughs> who, who then became a dentist? So I'd love to know. But it's I, also, probably not. Probably yeah. not. But, you know. <laughs> you never know. They could have all gone on and formed <laughs> bands that, are, you know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yes. But just. Maybe there's say, an interview in Germany right now where somebody's saying, yeah, the reason I formed a band, my first experience was this crazy <laughs> English people came and played in my classroom. And I thought I could do better than that. Yeah. So going slightly back to 87, which is possibly the great year of music, one of the great years of music, this is where you did your Janice Long session, wasn't it? Mm. This yeah. is it. This is Janice yeah. Long picked up you, picked up. So this is the precious recordings of London have gone. This is a it's, great it's idea. It's just out, yeah. yeah. It is just coming. Or is it just out? So, yeah, so Janice was obviously a big fan of the band. Yeah, she was lovely. And how did it compare on, Bob, to... So... Yes. How did this come about? And was it any different to a John Peel session, if you'd done a John Peel session? Well, we know this was the only session we ever did for the BBC, so we, we never got invited to do a Peel session. Um I can't remember how Janice Long got in touch, first of all. Would well, you remember us going to the studio? Oh, we went course, to the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that, was, that so was how she got. She came, yeah, and I think, so we just, she, we were booked to do a session, but just to get to know us, which is it's like a great gesture. She just said, why don't you come up to the studio while I'm doing my evening show and hang out? Yeah. Which is great. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so we, me and Mark went up there. Um, and well, Peel was, was there because he did the show afterwards. And it was just like, yeah, in the days where, you know, the radio shows, the DJs went to Broadcasting House. They broadcast yeah. live yeah. most of the time. So we were sitting there chewing the fat with Janice. Um, she was playing records and chatting to us in, in between time. And Peel comes in and he uh, kind of makes us a cup of tea and he's chatting as well. Um, and it was just like, wow, you know, these people are our mates, you know. Um, <laughs> and it was great. So, um, yeah. Do you we, remember, Bob, she played She played the... Uh... My favourite dress, do you remember yes. wedding present? Yes, she played My Favourite Dress by the wedding present. And you know, I was talking about, the first earlier, time. about how uh, I'd, I'd kind of tuned out of contemporary music and I was just going into the past and I was just getting back into kind of, you know, oh, okay, there are a few interesting bands around. And she played My Favourite Dress by the wedding present. And it was while it was playing and she was chatting to us, I was like, this is really good. This is really good. I really like this. And so without any uh, warning, <laughs> he uh, faded out the yeah. record. Ah, that's my favourite just by the Roman present. Um, and he shared with me some members of the Venice. What do you think of that one, lads? And I went, yeah, she just, yeah. Uh, uh, really good. So, um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure any recordings of that survived, but um, that was, yeah, we were put on air expressing our um. So it wasn't uh, like Dale, it wasn't like the Dale Griffith experience where you went in Maid of Elle and you recorded the session. You actually did it when she was recording her show? No, 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 no. This was just a precursor. This was just her kind of getting to know us. This, I mean, we did the session, like, a couple of months later. Um, this was just, um, this was just yeah, showbiz, above and beyond the Call of Duty. So just kind of being <laughs> yeah. friendly, you know. God, this is, this is like Howard Stern, so just when we actually did the session, the we just, and chatting. Yeah, when we yeah. did the session, we'd actually been on tour, and we did a, like, about two-and-a-half-week tour of Europe. So we were actually... 
quite well rehearsed, luckily. Uh, so when, when we came straight off that, and I think a few days later went into um, Made of Ale, I think it was Made of Ale Studios. Yeah, it was Made of Ale. Session. We didn't actually have a great experience of, of the session itself. I'm not sure why. I think it was just because we were quite belligerent in terms of how we wanted to be recorded and we were quite um, defensive about producers or anyone trying to kind of modify our sound. So we were, we were quite suspicious. So we didn't, we didn't actually have a great time. Although everyone, everyone else who, who does BBC session says, oh, it's great to be recorded so well, but we, we weren't, we didn't have um, a great experience as we thought at the time. And then I heard a tape, when we heard the, the results of the session, I really didn't like it. I don't know. And and I never had a copy of it. I, I thought, I don't want a copy of this. This is terrible. I didn't listen to it. And about five years ago, because you could do this, I got, you can contact the BBC and they'll send you a CD. Obviously, you have to, you know, license it and pay money if you want to release it. But about five years ago, I got a CD and I played it. Oh, this is actually really good and it is, is really good and um the precious thing came about was last year last summer because I'm, I'm playing at the moment i'm playing in um guitar in the swansea sound with uh which is the band that me and rob the effect rob percy are in um and we went to glasgow um played the glasgow's pop festival and there was Nick from Precious Recordings just had his stall out and all the sessions and all these great looking. But I thought, oh, we, had a, we had a session. I'd love to have one of these. And so immediately just said, well, Nick's here. And I mean, she introduced, she introduced us and Nick said, I'd love to put the dentist out. And that's how it happened. Um, and it's uh, it's been on pre order. And I believe that it's just, it exists now. The, the hard copies, uh, final copies exist. And um, I believe, who was your, who um, was the producer for that session? Uh, do you know what? I can't remember. Uh, I'd have to look it up. I wonder if it was Dale Griffith. I think it might have been. Yes, it it does yeah. sound. I mean, I have to say, I'm amazed you didn't like it because it does sound brilliant. I love. Yeah, it's I, way I, to I, go when I look at it, when I look at it, I listen to it now. I think no, that sounds really good. I don't know why. So, I, don't like it. I can tell you if you want to know what it was. Harry Parker. Harry. Have you got it in front of you? Okay. Yeah, Harry. I've got it in front of me. Yeah, produced by Harry Parker, engineered by Mike Robinson. Oh, uh, recorded Robinson. at Made of Owl on the twenty second of March, nineteen eighty seven. Yeah. What a moment! And um, what was the whose idea was it to do the Joni Mitchell cover? Well, I'm not sure whose idea it was. It was a, it was a cover we'd always done. We'd oh. we'd done it. It was it was I done about a staple in the set, but it's certainly something we we had been, we've been playing for some for time. Yeah, been, yeah, been in and, and it was while. popular. Yeah, we were playing it on that on the tour. We just done. We were playing it. Yeah, it's it might have been my songs. idea actually. It might have been my yeah. idea because May, uh, maybe just as, yeah because I I used to when I I would have been at art college at this time and I used to hang out with a guy called Greg and we used to play and it, <laughs> this is bizarre but a lot of Frank Sinatra when we were drawing and painting. Uh, and Frank Sinatra does a really good cover of both sides now. And I think I heard the Frank Sinatra version and suggested it to the band before I even knew it was Joni Mitchell. So uh, it might well, may well have been my idea. Mm. Mm, it sounds brilliant. I, I you know I have to say, I love that that label. I think he's, Nick has done, yeah. done such an amazing job. And yeah. it's a brilliant project. I hope he has success, well, enough success to keep going really. Yeah. Yes, because yeah. it's a label of love. Yes, anyway, there you go. So when, when when that came out, did the band start to sort of fade a bit, though? When, you know, before your next album, which was a couple of mm. years later, was that the Lost Years? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, we had, uh, I don't know, we lost momentum for some reason. I think we had, I suppose there's only so... For the first kind of three years, we just kept pumping out the releases and not really getting anywhere. Um, and every 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 release was like this one. This is the big push. Oh, right. the next one. That's the big push. And then um, I think with that, when that baby session BBC session came out, I think then we released the Riding on the Shag Pile, and that was 
distributed by Pinnacle and they were going to give it a big push. And they gave it a big push and it just about got into the indie chart, and but it still wasn't a great success. And then you think, oh, and then you go through this period of, right, contemplating your next move. Um, we got signed by um, a label in Belgium called uh, Antler and had one release on them that didn't really do much and then we kind of um they were kind of really thinking what do we do with this band we were thinking what do we do and we spent basically in the next couple of years thinking about what we should do next rather than actually doing anything um so yeah they, that were that was a bit of a lost uh, era but um at the end of that really um it would have fizzled out but for the fact that then um we got renewed interest in in the states which we kind of we had letters from the states from various people and we knew various radio um, stations were playing us but we didn't really know how to kind of build on that and then um a couple of people jim mcgarry the wall um started hustling for us in the States and, and Jim in particular started to try and get record companies interested and, and basically got us yeah. out there and um, paid for us to go out there in 1991 and mm. that really opened up a new a completely new chapter for us because um until you actually go somewhere I think you can have like interest but until you actually go somewhere you don't really realize how much interest there is and then you know it, it was just a bit of a new lease of life and we also you know we got a new drama rob rob Grieg, who was who was brilliant um and he also gave the band a new lease of life and so we had a you know we could have easily already split us split up or just fizzled out by then but we we basically went you know got interest in the states had a you know and a cu good couple of albums went on tour there and ultimately of course it it never ended in major success but you know we had we had some fantastic years out there uh, just you know doing well, doing because what was it like during that sort of period because that kind of 87 the smiths break up there's the kind of ecstasy world with Manchester, but then we had seattle grunge scene there was the kind yeah. of 4AD label with Throne Muses and the Pixies and then you're you're sort of in your own world you're not sort of there with my bloody Valentine and you know the no. dealers mm. and Silverfish so I just wondered how it was you know trying to sort of find your your place in the scheme yeah I think I think that's a good point David I think I think we were slightly out of time in terms of what was going on I think that's a very good point we go, going back to the Belgians that Bob was saying the Belgians were very keen to find the next kind of Manchester band that wasn't Manchester so they wanted us to be baggy so they were very keen to I mean they even took us to a Belgian nightclub to listen to the latest Belgian <laughs> kind of disco sounds to see if that would rub off, off on us you know they wanted a kind of sort of stone roses happy Mondays kind of shuffly kind of droney kind of stuff and and there's one track on heads and how to read them which is our album on, on that though, which is where we sort of semi-attempted it but it was never going to stick but you, you're absolutely right david we were slightly slightly out of time um slightly too early for creation you know and, and not not really not didn't really fit in anywhere else which i think is why we sort of stalled around 87. yeah <laughs> that's my personal opinion yeah. but and did you play most of them did you sort of manage to sort of get around the whole thing because a lot of bands break up and you know, from doing this show quite a lot, and it's often after they've been to America and they've done the tour, and they've gone, they've often said, and we came back, and that was the end of the band because we were just emotionally done. In did you did you have a better experience with America than that? I, th I think so. As, as Bob said, that really gave us the impetus because we we were fading. I think based on being slightly popular in Belgium and probably nowhere else. And then suddenly we realised that actually there was quite a good following in, in the States. And, and, you know, decent decent labels were very interested. Homestead, Matador, you know, really interesting labels. Suddenly were, couldn't believe the dentists were kind of on their shores and in town. And, and that really did, that was very flattering for us. And we, we were very, um, 
you know, it absolutely, it, it, it was almost like somebody giving us CPR, you know, it absolutely kicked us off again. <laughs> and then to meet these Americans, you know, Bob's with, you know, a chap called Bob Wall and a chap called Jim McGarry, who, who'd who been lifelong fans and collected our stuff and then had started writing to record labels and promoting us and were prepared to put their money where their mouth was to support us and help us. You know, that, that was a revelation as well to have people who were, so keen to get involved and, and support the band. It really did kind of kickstart us again, really. It was, it was almost like a second yeah. piece of life. I would also say that what was refreshing about America was that, you know, in the UK, everything so gravitates towards what's the latest thing. So there was baggy, and then there was uh, shoegazing, and then the, you have to be in it or not. And I found that in in the states, um, particularly post Nirvana, post grunge, there was just a it was just a kind of a complete breaking open of and, and there was no it was almost like you know anything goes. It was it almost reminded me of that like post punk era of um, Britain where you had bands you know as bizarre you know widespread as um, you know, Sebado or Pavement or uh, Poster Children or whoever else. So that's probably not a particularly diverse list, but you know, <laughs> that there was. It was like you didn't, you didn't have to kind of be narrowly fitting into a particular genre. And also, I think the thing that worked to our advantage in a good way in America was in Britain we were kind of dismissed because we'd just been regarded as these no, no hopers that have just been releasing these mm. DIY releases for years and not getting anywhere. Um, and in America, I think that was actually um, regarded as a very positive thing. That, that was kind of to be lauded, you know, you know, the fact that you were this, you know, DIY suddenly became, uh, you know, something to be proud of. <laughs> The fact that we've kind of been plugging away uh doing this this kind of diy stuff with like guided by voice i guess did for years um that was actually a kind of uh badge of honor rather than something that was to, to be derided yes it's interesting because because you know i've what i've sort of noticed that each i mean america is so big that's an obvious thing to say but you know each area has its own kind of quite you know loyal yeah. or local music scene yeah you know, doesn't it you know yeah. from you know georgia to la to seattle mm. to you know all mm. around and it mm. just depends on who's in that place at that time yeah. and bands seem you know it's like what i've also noticed that people then just have to move away for college or work and it's like oh well that person went so you know a band was is slightly more fluid in a way you know and then people mm. kind of like well half of that band left and the half of that band left so the other members got together and formed another band it you know and people seem a bit more loose because i suppose people realize they're going to have to move away from where they are whereas in the uk we can sort of almost stay where where we want to without any kind of i don't know work commitments or you, you know study commitments it's it's a little bit easier to sort of put your roots down and stay there so um it's i don't know it's um it's probably a sweeping statement but that's that's one thing i've basically noticed yeah and that makes sense you know, so um, yes, and they're less uptight about stuff as well. That's a sweeping statement. So when you um, yes, so then you got a fourth album on East West, East West. That's right, isn't it? East West yep. Records. So this is kind of. Well, did you feel quite surreal at this stage in the in the sense of like, God, a major <laughs> label is is really looking looking to sign you for some major moment? Yeah, uh, without without a doubt, there, there was a couple of weeks and. and... Uh, Bob, I think you said you didn't actually know this, but there was a couple of weeks when things got very surreal because East West signed us and then almost immediately we signed to East West, Creation tried to sign us. So um, we ended up putting out a, a record on, crea on a, a Creation offshoot um, called Ball Product, which was um, part of the Creation kind of family because they couldn't put out a new record because we'd signed to East West, but we could release stuff that we'd already um put out before so we ended up doing that with creation just to kind of test the water but for for literally for a couple of weeks we were the we were the toast of the town everybody wanted a piece of the of the dentist but it didn't last uh more than a couple of weeks but initially the 
the the situation with East West was very positive. They were very keen. They put you know prepared to put money behind us. We had quite a good label manager at East West. Um, and unfortunately, she got poached by Mick Hucknall to be his personal assistant, and uh, then we never really recovered from that with East West because the 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 chap they gave us after that was not quite as enthusiastic. It was it was a bit of kudos to try and sign the coolest band that you could, and and she got the kudos for kind of getting us signed. And then the chap who inherited us, you know, obviously it wasn't his it wasn't his kudos that he'd signed the coolest band. He wanted to sign another cool band, so he lost a bit of interest. Um, but yeah, it was it was interesting for a while. I don't I don't think we made the most of the opportunity. We were still a little bit reserved. I think a little bit of um, we should have thrown ourselves into it a bit more. Yes, my God, where did you go to record the album, and who was your producer for that one? Bob, we uh, we recorded it in the UK, and East to West were surprisingly hands off as regards the album. Uh, we just kind of organised that ourselves. Uh, and, um, with our manager, uh, Pat Ma. So he knew a guy called Ingmar Kayang. Uh, that was his name, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who had done a couple of things. He, he famously, well, not famously, but he produced the, the suede demos that got them signed, apparently. Um, anyway, he'd done a couple of things. And he was, he was really, uh, I think he was a really good producer. And um, we've, we've recorded it in London, recorded it and mixed it in London exactly 30 years ago, as we speak. Um, uh, and yeah, so East West were fairly hands off. They gave us, you know, a decent enough budget, probably small by major label standards, but still mega, you know, amount more than we'd ever spent on a record before. So um, we did. I think a really good job. I'm still very proud of that record. I, I hold that up yeah. as the best thing, you know, certainly among, I mean, everyone goes on about some people on the pitch, rightly so, because it's it's inspired and brilliant. But, you know, I, I'd put behind the door, I keep the universe on equal pegging to that. Um, yes. And more, you know, it, I think it's, uh, yeah, very, very proud of that. I think it's just, just came out just very well. Yes. And whose was the idea of the album cover by the way <laughs> good, uh, good i can't remember i uh, not can i say not mine <laughs> not yours um, i don't remember it being mine oh they're probably collaborative i would have thought i remember yeah. uh because the record company what they they do is they they we came mick came up with the album title behind the door i keep the universe so that Did was it, definitely even the mixed title um, and then the, the the record company then make loads of suggestions about how they could illustrate that, and I think they they just wanted to work with a particular designer who seemed intent on random images that he uh, he then decided he was going to use Rob's head to uh, put them onto. Yeah. So we thought that was quite funny at the time, but now it does look a bit lame. But at the time, we thought it was quite good. Otherwise, I suck. But we didn't let them do the second, the, the next album we did ourselves in the end, artwork wise. But yeah, maybe that's not yes. much better. But yeah, but you did a big tour. You did a big tour of the U USA at this day, yeah. stage with Shown a Knife. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Was that a good? Was that a good experience? That was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I mean that was that was the crazy only, Japanese. What could go wrong? Well. Really, really big tour we did, and it's only like proper American tour we ever did. Uh, but I'm so glad we did it. Yeah, that was great, 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 great fun. Yeah, the best thing the best thing about Shannon Knife was we because we saw uh, I mean we didn't know anything about them particularly we knew who they were and we heard a few bits and pieces and we saw them the first time and we we thought oh, God these people are going to get these girls are going to get eaten alive you know they're just like so innocent and twee they, they, how are they going to survive six weeks in the states on tour it's just going to be ridiculous and then we saw them again the second night and and they were saying and doing the same things they'd done the previous night and then. We saw them again the third night and they did exactly the same things and said the same things and got the same reactions. And we thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> These are seasoned professionals who know exactly yeah. what they're doing. They absolutely owned the whole place. It was just, it was phenomenal to watch. Once we were sort of in on the, yeah. uh, not the joke as such, but in on the, on the performance, then it was, it was a joy to watch, you know, because they'd, They'd literally do this kind of uh, sort of you know broken broken English kind of introduction, and they'd pretend not to know where they were, and 
Uh, they tell a story about what they'd done during the day, and it was always the same story. They went to the, the same park thing. and I saw some squirrels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And everyone laughed. And everybody was like, the they said squirrels, and yeah, and everyone thought, ah, oh, they lovely, and not they just they were kind of yeah, it, not in a bad way, but they were just like totally in control. Of their audience. Phenomenal, yeah. And we were like, yeah, we've heard this squirrel story every every city we've played in so far. So I yeah, it, it was like... very clever. It's the Frank Sinatra thing, isn't it? And those kind of anecdotes that yeah. all seem so, yeah. yes, made up on the spot, but just rolled out. So you were the, yeah, you know, the Brit Pop is kind of steaming along at this stage. Were you feeling kind of for the next album on East West, it was there to be taken? Yeah, I think that's a fair, that's a fair thing um, to say, David. And I think we were a bit that, Deep Six has got some really good songs on it, um, but we definitely lost our way in terms of we we should have stuck. I mean, hindsight's a beautiful thing. We should have stuck with Ingmar because he he had captured what well, I, I don't know about Bob, but I consider to be the sort of proper sound of the dentist. Um, but we didn't, and we got talked into using Walton Tears, who produced Sonic Youth, amongst other people, and was a really really nice guy, but was very confused by the dentists, to put it mildly. Um, and we made a lot of mistakes and we were caught between a rock and a hard place. We didn't know whether to embrace the Britpop thing and try to get involved in that. And we didn't know whether to keep separate to that and do our own thing. And I don't I don't think we ended up in anywhere. We just ended up in the middle of nowhere, really, I think. I, I don't know. That's my take yeah. on it, really, Bob. I, I don't really remember us. I, I was going on Deep Six. We, we, we just had these... We were going... I think our songs were developing. We were going a bit more kind of atonal, experimental, just and Mick Mick was particularly. Um, I don't think we were, we were certainly chasing the brick pop thing. If anything, we were just a bit. Oh, now now you get it. We've been doing this for years. Yeah. You know. Um, you know True. Um, so and, and and the other thing, brick pop was obviously a very at least in the other days was very much a, you know, a, yeah, by definition, a UK music press invention and and i think you know the new the uk music press were just so they could not be less interested in us um we, i mean we didn't get any house room at all so i think we were beyond i think we were beyond the stage where we were kind of chasing the latest fad we would just think well look we're doing our own thing we've got our songs oh, um, we might not have been bob i think i think east west were definitely thinking hang on a minute we've got a we've got a brit band here who play yeah. pop music? Surely that's Maybe. Brit pop. How do we yeah. how do we utilize that? I'm I'm sure Maybe. that's what they were thinking. Because they I'm were all, what... you know they were all about the units, weren't they? They weren't about the aesthetics of what we were I, doing. I still I still don't know what East West were ever thinking <laughs> with us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we never got to the bottom of that. Was it, was it just a very disappointing experience? Your Deep Six album. I think we yeah we we behind the door. Kit Universe did well on the college charts, but didn't sell. Deep Six come out and didn't do well on the college charts <laughs> and also didn't yeah. sell. So I think, yeah, we just kind of thought, when we signed to East West, we thought, I think, personally, I thought, well, we know we've got mass kind of potential. Now that we're on a major label, we'll just get loads of coverage and obviously we'll, loads of people will recognise and as, as we become popular and obviously it's not as simple as that and I'm not sure what why it wasn't that simple or what did or didn't happen. But anyway, it didn't. So signing to a major label, you think you've achieved success just by doing that. And obviously you haven't, but we didn't. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, we just kind of, after two albums, it was like, no. So at that stage, did you start recording some demos for a potential new album? Yeah, we did. We carried we carried on recording. We um we got offered the chance to work with Mike Hedges. Um, I think well, this is the point where Bob decided he had enough of the whole thing. If we're honest, so so we got a chance to work with Mike Hedges, who who in, in his chateau in France, which was kind of even though we knew, I think we knew Bob, didn't we, that you were you were going to knock it on the head and call but, it a day. Yeah, I'd already um, decided that. Yeah. Yeah, we still couldn't pass up the chance to spend a week in a French chateau with a with a very well known producer to see what came out. But I think, with hindsight, I don't know as our heart was particularly in it at the time. It was very difficult to motivate ourselves, knowing that we were probably yeah. splitting great, up. 
Um, the great what if is so Mike Hedges was lined up as a possibility to do produce Deep Six. Um, but he, in the end, I, he couldn't do it, or maybe he was asking too much money or whatever, or too much money, but or, but it didn't happen. But I just, the, the great what if is what if Mike Hedges had produced Deep Six? It would probably take him mm. four times as long because he was a taskmaster. Great, great, great fella. But, and it was great experience working with him. But um, yeah, that would have been a very different album. Yeah, um, yeah, he did the Manic Street Preacher, didn't he? Directly after our session, just after ours, yeah, about a year, yeah, maybe quite soon yeah. after us. Yeah, but as Mark says, by that time, I'd already, even when we're doing that session, I'd already decided I was, I was kind of getting out. So, um, no. but I, I really enjoyed that. That um, we did two tracks with him, which appeared on our compilation. If all the flies were on fly, um, and the other thing we did just before that was, I think in a because East West, uh, sorry, Amos was on that label, and we decided, I think, off our own back to record a version, our own version of Cornflake Girl. And I think, I think we had some vague idea that this will make them notice. They'll put this yeah, we out did, yeah, single and it will be really big. But they didn't, and it didn't. So, but I, I'm still that's that's a really I I I was just uh, had that one in the car the other day and. This is nice. I think that should be good. It's brilliant. Yeah, it really is. In good, fact, yeah. I, I was I was listening. I was watching a TV program. It was um, I'll tell you exactly what it was. It was um, I can't remember the name. It's called Beef, and it's on Netflix. And they had uh, they had a good soundtrack, and they had Cornflake Girl. And I don't think I've ever heard that version for so many years. The sorry, I'm sorry. But I don't know, it just doesn't sound right. I, I almost think ours is the definitive version. Yeah, so <laughs> I like I like uh, yeah Netflix. Use our use our songs. Yes. So what were yeah. the other tracks that Mike did with you for that demo? Those demos, the Cornflake Girl. Which were the other ones? No, he didn't do Cornflake Girl. We did that on our own at, at Red in in Rochester. Mike Hedges did. We recorded two tracks. Uh, Settle down and pay. Both also both of which were unreleased until we we put them on the If All the Flies compilation. Okay. But I remember, I mean, that we, I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't around for the mixing, but we spent three days, I think, recording those two tracks. And that was the slowest we'd ever worked, even even on the, the two albums. Um, and it was a taste of like, you know, when we would never, we could never understand when bands would spend months making an album. Because I remember when we made some people on the pitch, I think we took four and a half days or something or five days recording and mixing everything. And I remember even at the time, Billy Childish saying to us, you made five, you took you five days to make an album. Like, what are you, Pink Floyd or something? <laughs> so by midway standards, that was like ridiculous. Indulgent. And then, but then yeah. I remember when we were recording, we were mixing behind the door. We went to this studio in London and they couldn't believe we were mixing more than one song a day, just mm. mixing. And it's like, you get, kind of get a sense of how, you know, the recording process is is just... Uh, anyway, long story short, Mike Edges, we do, we, we just spent ages and ages doing the same songs and playing them over and over again and doing the parts. And you can you kind of get an eye opener into kind of how, you know, proper, you know, professional albums are made. And, and we thought we were really good. And I just remember him saying to us once is, if you come to work with me again, don't you ever come uh, so under-rehearsed? And we thought, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> we're very good, you know. But no, it was, it was like, uh, you know. Yes. So it was a good, really good experience. A disapproving yeah. parent. Yes. Yeah. So, so once the, when you decided the band was over, did you then just give music a bit of a sideline until decades later or did it sort of tick along in the background well yeah i mean we, we then went in separate kind of directions but but the dentists tried to carry on without without bob we got another guitarist in um a chap named chris flack and we we carried on as a band called cokes it couldn't be it couldn't be the dentist so we we wrote new songs uh, and cokes put an album out 
in the States uh, and had a single out and went through various lineup changes. But then that kind of all fell apart, really. Everybody basically decided it wasn't really working. Um, and then, yeah, we've been in sort of bits and pieces, I guess. Nothing long term, really, would you say, Bob? I don't know. Any of your bands long term? No, until no, we formed no. the Treasures of Mexico. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I didn't read, I didn't do anything for much for about five years after Dennis. I was in a band called Fortune West with my friend Gary Robertson, some other people recorded one single. Um, there was a little project that Mick did. It's the only thing he's done post Dennis called the Fortress Madonna, which is a bit of a mysterious project. But I think me, I played on some of that. I think Mark might have played on some tracks. Yeah, I played on a couple. Yeah. It was all a bit kind of uh, mysterious, but an album came out uh, and an EP. Um, I joined, I've been in a band, I was in a band called Stuart Turner and the Flat Earth Society um, with Stuart Turner. And uh, I was on about three albums. That kind of band kind of ended kind of with lockdown and really hasn't resurrected. Um, I did. Uh, a kind of solo, not really a solo album, but album under my own name, Bob Collins and the Phil Nelson, with Rob, who is in the dentist, and then Mark Aiken. Um, uh, that's just a one off that came out in 2015. And uh, The Treasures of Mexico, which is really Mark's band, but that's our current kind of thing we're playing this weekend. Yes. Um, and we've got a third album coming out. So it's Mark. Mark uh, writes the songs and sings, but I'm very happy to be a part of that. Yes, I do. Right that. answer. <laughs> um, and as I said before, I'm, I'm also playing in the, the Swansea Sound at the moment as well. Uh, which, which is, is really, a bit of really an indie supergroup, isn't it? It is a bit, yeah, yeah. You know, this is... This a bit is jealous of the to gosh, to the gosh, the poo sticks and the dentists. All and in Amelia one. Fletcher. And, and, uh, and uh, the Flashing Dubs, which was Ian's uh, drums band, yeah. So. Yes. So with the with the release of this um, Janice Long session, has it meant that the the members of the band have been in communication with each other? Well, me, <laughs> me and Mark have. So Mick, yeah. Mick, 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 Mick moved to Africa. We moved out of the country a long time ago. He's been in Nairobi for 10, yeah. about twenty years. So we, I mean, the last time we saw Mick, we 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 did a reform, a reformed dentist, a couple of gigs in twenty ten. Um, it's a bit miraculous that even that happened. So mix, I don't think. I think it's fair to say he's not really um, uh, doesn't have any great desire to kind of uh, play music uh, and do any kind of authentic stuff. But we're kind of in sporadic contact with him. Yeah, I think that's fair. We we um, we he he shares a birthday with a couple of mutual friends, and we. They, they communicate with each other on their birthday in October, and that's normally the only time we ever hear that he's, he's still alive. <laughs> Apart from that, we, uh, we did, I did get a random uh, phone call from him about five years ago where he wanted to meet me at seven o'clock in the morning and just give me loads of old dentist memorabilia and bits and a trumpet and a guitar and some various other stuff that he couldn't store in the UK anymore. So he just decided it was all going my way. So I gave the guitar to Bob and kept the trumpet, basically, and the uh, probably most of the most of the memorabilia. But that's the last time I saw Mick, I think. Yes. So he's uh, and unfortunately, as you probably you may or may not know, we lost Alan, who was the drummer on the uh, the Janice Long sessions. Unfortunately, Alan died um, in a, in a house fire so um, a few years ago. So yeah, which is which is very sad because he would have loved all this sort of stuff. He um, he sort of left the band of his own accord. He was just girls you know women what can you do they just they just ruin your life so alan, alan was talked alan was talked out of going on tour one time and uh we we couldn't we couldn't really work that way so he um he sort of resigned his commission if you like on the band and uh then we never really kept in touch that well but um he was just sort of coming back into the fold a bit alan he was just kind of yeah, starting to turn up at things wasn't he and um we were sort of looking forward to him being around again and then unfortunately um yeah, he had a what we have for all intents and purposes an accident, uh, an accident, and um, yeah, um, and died in a house fire, unfortunately. So yeah, yeah it's ten years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So he he would have loved this session coming out. He would have been he would have been absolutely chuffed to bits by it, really. So yes, and it sounds like with this and all your other bits, you've you've done all your archive. There's nothing. There's no other hidden material, is there? Oh, there's loads, David. There's loads. <laughs> is there? If all the flies were one fly, just scratch the surface. Yeah, I'd, but you know. we did tape everything, so. <laughs> we did tape everything, and we got loads, yeah. loads of live tapes. We do. We put things on. I put things the odd track on SoundCloud occasionally, just in a low key way. So. Yes, you still find that um, people are sort of reaching out to you, all sort of curious with the band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a small circle, but it's it's a very enthusiastic one. So we got to go, you know, Twitter, little Twitter following, and Facebook group, and. Uh, so, we tested the water, didn't we, Bob, with a with a, an acoustic session a few months ago, yeah. where we we Bob and I rocked up and played eight 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 dentist songs. Yeah, think, yeah. Just to a sort of lunchtime audience, just to see if anybody was interested, and that went down fairly well. So we've been asked to repeat that a couple of times. But yeah, we might, we're, we're going to do. We might do that. Uh, yeah, we will yeah. definitely, we'll definitely do that sometime. Yeah. And with this release, will you do any kind of other promotion for it, or will will it just come out like it? You know, all the others have. Other, other have we, have we been asked to do any promotion? Yeah. Yeah. Other, no, other than the acoustic thing, I don't think. No, no. Um, but, you know, we'll just we'll plug it through the socials, as they the say. The social media sites. Yes. <laughs> well, we did. I was going to say, David, we did do quite a thing. I don't, again, I don't know if you, how were you track, you know, bits and pieces on YouTube, but we did a thing. Uh, and Bob will tell me how many years ago, five years ago, more than that, seven years ago, where we invited guest singers. So it mm. was the, the the backing band, if you like. So, you know, Bob playing guitar, me playing bass, Ian and Bob playing drums, and we just got guests to come in and sing. And that was quite a, a bit of a sort of that a celebration brilliant. of the dentist. Yeah. yeah, that worked really well. That was very, that very was, entertaining uh, indeed. Yeah, that was... There's quite a bit of it on YouTube. 3rd of January 2015. Yeah. A I, while ago now. Yeah, I think that's something we possibly could do again because that was really good fun. Yes. Yeah, it was really, really good fun. People came, a couple of people came from America to sing on that. Yeah, specifically to do it, yeah. God, that's fantastic. I know the Heavenly are reforming for a, a couple of live dates and that's all sold yeah. out. So, um, yeah, we're, the, we're, we're playing with them on uh, on uh, this Saturday. On Saturday. Mexico. Yeah. Blimey. In Raynham. That's it's their awful. kind of warm up for their big London gigs. And it's funny because I did an interview with the Bolshoi, a couple of all three of the members, and uh, two of them have kind of reformed as a slightly different version of the Bolshoi, called themselves the Bolshoi Boys. So I think there's something, you know, people after a few decades or three decades get quite a bit curious and interested of uh, playing some more music again. So, yeah, I mean, if you'd said to us like in our 20s that when we were both. 57 years old people would be still interested in what we did when you know the songs we wrote when we were 20 we'd be like are you kidding but so the fact that they are and the fact that we can still do it i think yeah that's just you know you've got to do it haven't you yeah, yeah why not yeah the searchers are still doing it and they're in their 80s yeah. <laughs> this is going to be their last tour apparently they've decided uh, 80 was enough so but they, they, that's, yeah, all right. But they, they hate each other, don't they? Oh, they're, they're not even, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I, yeah. There'll be a day maybe when there are like two rival versions of the dentists both trying to sue each other for those naming <laughs> rights. <laughs> <laughs> the royalty check. <laughs> yes. Anyway, look, this has been fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much. And if you want, I can always send you the link and then you can put it on your socials and that'll be amazing. Of course we will. Of course we yeah, will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you ever so much for your time. This has been amazing. And um, I'm just so ple pleased that Precious has uh, done such a great job. Yeah. 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 yeah it is. It's sounds, it, the whole package looks and sounds fantastic. So I'm very pleased. I'm yes. very excited to be getting a, we, I think we're getting our hands on copies this weekend. So that'll be, it's really great. So thanks to Nick yeah. for, for doing that. Yeah, vinyl and CD. Anyway, look, I'll let you go. But thanks again for your time. This has been amazing. You're welcome, David. It's Brilliant. Been a pleasure. Nice to meet you, David. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thanks a lot. Take care. See you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Luck with the summer. Bye-bye. Thank yeah. you. And that, dear listener, is the end of the interview with 
both Mark Matthews, Bob Collins from The Dentists. If you want to know any more information about that release, just go to the Precious Recordings of London and you'll find uh, their session with Jonas Long, but also lots of other fantastic sessions that uh, Nick and his, um, well, just Nick basically is putting out. We love the Precious Recordings of London. This has been the C86 Show, David Eastall. If you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. Yes, indeed. And also, all these interviews have been archived. Aren't you lucky? You can find those Spotify, iTunes, Podbean. It's true. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.